Any problems from uh, previous chapters or sections I have to do before I proceed? Okay, hearing none, we will proceed to section uh, 2.6, where uh, you guys are assigned to do problems um, hmm, 2-7. Forget about 2-6. 1 to 9 odd. So if I do 2 and 2 to 8 even, that ought to be fair. Okay. Now, um, why are we skipping 2 6? Well, 2 6 is mechanical. Why are we doing 2 7? 2 7 is electrical, and I'm an electrical engineer, so that's not really. So if I was a mechanical guy, I would do 2 6, but I'm not. I'm an electrical guy, so I'll do 2 7. So when, when I have some electrical circuit that has a resistor and a capacitor and an inductor in it, then I look at that circuit and I say, well, the voltage across the resistor is IR, which is um, Ohm's law. The um, voltage across the capacitor is um, Q over C where C is uh, the capacitance of the capacitance in farads, and Q is the charge of the capacitor. The uh, voltage across the inductor is going to be um, DI DT L. So change in current, change in time, times L, the inductance of the inductor, which is going to be in Henry, um, that'll, that'll be the voltage across the inductor. So now I have um, a guy by the name of Kirchhoff that says uh, the summation of the voltages through a loop have to be zero. So that means that the, the voltage across the source has to equal the voltage drop across the resistor plus the voltage drop across the capacitor uh, plus the voltage drop across the inductor. And then I say, well, that looks like I've got too many variables. So I say, well, what is current? Current is change in charge, change in time. So now I can write, rewrite the equation voltage across the, the source. My source voltage is going to be uh, dQ dt r plus Q over C plus the second derivative of the, of the um, charge. I could write a charge. And um, L, where um, R is in uh, ohms, and uh, Q is in coulombs. Anybody can spell coulombs, C-O-U-L. O M B maybe, and um, the capacitance is in farad. And um, inductance is in Henry's. So now I can I can come up with a differential equation by having some electrical circuit, and then I can solve for current at any time. I could have an equation for current. All I'd have to do is solve for Q and take the derivative of Q, and now I have the current in the circuit. Or I can, I can solve for voltage across the circuit. I can do many different things. Okay? So that, that's the, the physics involved in, in this situation. I just have... And then if I, if I throw away one of them, then I just have a first-order differential equation instead of a second-order one. So I, I could do it with just a resi resistor and a capacitor, or do it with just an inductor and a resistor, and I could, I could have problems that way, too. All right, so now let's look, look at problem number two. Uh, we, are, we have the same circuit as in problem one, but I'm initially in position two. So if I'm in position 2, that means my current at time 0 is 0. 
it's not that's an initial condition but to, uh, but it's thrown to position one at t is zero so my current at time zero is zero my e is going to be 100 volts. Notice that it, it, this is a DC voltage because it's not, it doesn't give some frequency associated with it. And I want to find I of T. And so I want to find I of T and I want to show that um, I of T goes to 4 as the current, as the time goes to infinity. Okay, so those are the things that I want to do. All right, well, wanting is one thing. So I got a, I got a, a battery that's uh, 100 volts and uh, I got a switch it's going to go that way I got an inductor the voltage across the inductor is L D I D T um, do I know what L is? no I don't that's fine and over here I've got a resistor R do I know what R is no I don't that's fine too voltage across the resistor is um, I R and so now we can say that 100 is equal to um, D I D T L plus I R and we say well that particular equation appears to be in the form um, y prime plus px uh, pxy is equal to qx, right? It appears to be in that form. So we'll just put it in that form and say that uh, i prime is equal to uh, plus i prime plus um, R over L I is equal to 100 over L. Now we could go and say um, and use the other equation or we could say well you know I have a characteristic equation right you know my characteristic equation is R plus R over L equals zero so r would equal minus r over l so uh, y of c i of c we'll call it i i of c is equal to um, c1 e to the minus r over l and then we could say that um, i have a particular solution ip which is going to be equal to A and I got I prime P which is going to be equal to 0 and um, I've got 100 over L I, I want it to be 100 over L and, um, and what do I have? I have R over L of that guy and I got one of this guy so I've got a R over L um, is equal to 100 so A R is equal to 100 and um, A is going to be equal to um, 100 over R okay so I uh, at T is going to be the homogeneous solution um, C1 e to the minus r over lt plus the particular solution um, particular solution A which is 100 over r It looks like L is 5 and R is 25. So if R is uh, 25 ohms and L 
is 5 Henry because I'm using the same circuit as in 1 um, then I could, could rewrite that as a current at times t c1 e to the 5 minus 5t five plus 4 and then I'd apply my initial condition i at 0 is 0 um, implying that C1 has to be minus 4. So I of T would be minus 4 e to the minus 5t plus 4. Okay, so I, I found I of T. Now I'm going to show the limit as T goes to infinity of uh, I of T. And I'm going to say, well, that's 4, because this guy's going to go to 0 pretty fast, and all I'm going to have is 4 left over. Okay, good enough. But I could have done it using the other method. I didn't necessarily have to do what I just did. I, I could have gone and said, well, I have a first-order equation in the form y prime plus pxy plus P qx is equal to zero uh, is equal to qx. I, I could have done it that way and got the same same answer, but because I'm in chapter two, I'm using characteristic equation because that's what I'm supposed to be doing in chapter two. Okay, questions about that? If not, moving on to number four. Um, in the same circuit, we find. Um, the switch is in position 1, uh, with the switch in position 1, L is equal to 2, R is equal to 40, and E of T is equal to 100, E to the minus 10T. Now, you'd be hard pressed to get a power supply that does that. Uh, you know, go to Radio Shack and ask the clerk for one of them, he'd probably tell you to pack sand. And uh, I of 0 is 0. And um, find the maximum current. OK. So what, what they told us, um, they lied to us. Really, we're in position 2. And at time equal to 0, we're putting the switch into position 1. Otherwise, current couldn't be equal to zero. But that's uh, that's beside the point. Okay, so that that being the case, okay, so um, we have two i prime plus forty i is equal to one hundred e to the minus ten t. Okay, we have a characteristic equation. 2r plus 40 is 0, uh, r plus 20 is 0, r is equal to minus 20, i sub c is equal to c1 e to the minus 20 t. Okay, I, have a, I have a particular solution. IP, which is going to be a e to the minus 10t, um, I prime is uh, minus 10 a e to the minus 10t, and now when I get done, I want 100 e to the minus 10t, and I have um, two of something and so I got two of that one and I have 40 of this one and so I got um, 40 e to the minus 10 T minus 20 e to the minus 10 t and that's going to be 20 a 
e to the minus 10t, implying that a is 5. So i sub p is going to be 5 e to the minus 10t. Um, i of t is going to be the homogeneous solution, which was c1 e to the minus 20t plus the particular solution 5 e to the minus 10t um, using the, the initial condition i at 0 is 0 then I have c1 plus 5 have to be 0 implying that c1 is equal to minus 5 so now we're ready for final answer um, i of t is equal to minus 5 e to the minus 20t plus 5 e to the minus 10t. Find the maximum current in the circuit. Okay, so how are we going to find the maximum current? We're going to go and uh, find the derivative, set it equal to 0, at that time I will have the maximum, I'll solve it for t, I'll put it back in the original quest equation and find out what it is. Alright, so i prime t is equal to um, 100 e to the minus 20t minus 50 e to the minus 10t and uh, that's going to be 0 At where? Hmm. Well, I can divide everything by 50. So 0 is equal to 2 e to the minus 20t minus e to the minus 10t. Um, I can factor. No, oh, I don't know. Oh, what am I going to do with that? Okay, so 2 e to the minus 20t is equal to e to the minus 10t. Okay. I'm going to take the log of both sides. Okay, so I got the log of 2 minus I take the log of things that are multiplied together, that's the same as adding them, right? And so I can add the logs, and the, the log of e to minus, there's that, is uh, minus 10t log of 2 is equal to um, 10t. t is equal to log of 2 over 10. So this is going to be um, the time at uh, max. When I, when I get to that time, I got the max time. Okay, so now I'll put that back in the formula. So I look at i at natural log of 2 over 10. And uh, that's going to be um, minus 5 e to the minus 20 natural log of 2 over 10 plus, is it plus? plus 5 e to the minus 10 natural log 2 over 10 because I want to find the, so this will give me the maximum current um, minus 5 e to the natural log of, um, see 10 goes into that as minus 2, so that would be 2 to the minus 2 plus 5 e to the natural log of, um, of what? 
that goes away this with 2 to the minus 1. Alright, so we've got uh, minus 5 times 1 quarter plus 5 times 1 half. And uh, so I max is going to be. Um, hmm, hmm. 5 halves minus 5 quarters. That looks like 5 quarters. What do you think? That would be 5 quarters. Well, let's see. See what our author might think about this. We're doing 27 number 4. 27 number 4, 5 quarters. We didn't know it. Then they just torque you right off. Not once did my calculator leave my pocket. Yeah. All right. Well, that's okay. Um, number six. Uh, in the circuit uh, over there to the left, with the switch in position one. All right. So I've got L is one Henry, R is um, ten Henrys, and it's about time we get some some interesting current, right, uh, voltage, 30 cosine 60T plus 40 sine 60T. Is that regular house current coming out of the thingy? Um, no, it isn't. Um, 60 is not 60 hertz. Okay, um, what do we want to know? Substitute ISP of T is equal to that. Then determine A and B to find the steady state current ISP in the circuit. Write the solution in the form blah, blah, blah. Well, that looks like a pain in the you-know-where, doesn't it? Okay. Now, obviously there's they're speaking some kind of a Greek language there, so we'll have to go back and see where they do that. And we see that on page 175. They tell us that uh, the steady, steady periodic current, ISP, the transient current, ITR. Okay, and that the the total current are those two things put together. Okay, isn't that lovely? What if we really want to do that? Yeah, we probably do. In a typical case of alternating current, uh, E naught, blah, 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 and it is in the form, blah, 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 okay. As uh, with the mass, blah, 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 we have a transient current, we have a steady state current. Um, okay, well, we have a 30 there and a 40 there, don't we? That doesn't exactly meet our example. Uh-huh. There we are. Page 
Hmm. Well, I think I think what we should do here is go thirty cosine sixty t plus forty sine sixty t is equal to one. So the i prime uh, plus ten i. Okay, and then say, well, I have a um, i sub p, which is a cosine 60t plus b sine 60t. And I have an i prime of p, which is uh, minus a 60a sine 60t plus 60b cosine 60t. And if I take 10 of those and one of those, I should get 30 cosine plus 40 sine. OK, so I got 10, 10a plus 60b cosine 60t plus plus 10b minus 60b sine 60t implying that um, 30 is equal to 10a plus 60b and 40 is equal to um, I bet you this is an a no 10b minus 60a is uh, minus 60a plus 10b two equations to unknowns well um, maybe I should divide every thing by 10. Um, a plus 6b is 3 and uh, minus 6a plus b is 4. And now if I had my Excel spreadsheet out I could probably do that right away. But a is going to be you know, a 1 minus 6, 6, 1 on the bottom. Uh, 1, that's a 37 on the bottom, and I've got a, a 3, 4, 6, 1, 3 minus, minus, uh, minus 21, minus 24 plus 3. Okay, so that'd be my A. My B, I would still have 37 on the bottom, 1 minus 6, um, 3, 4, I got 4 minus a minus 18, so we have 22 over 37. So my ISP is going to be um, minus 21 over 37 cosine 60t plus 22 over 37 sine 60t. Then I want to put this in the form of cosine C cosine omega t plus alpha, and I don't think I can do that. I, I'm, I'm thinking that I can. And uh, <laughs> well, they say I can. All right, well, it must be, at least I got the ISP right. So now, how am I going to get that into the right form?
think I'll just stop there and then we'll move on. Uh, that was six. Looking at number eight. Suppose we have the circuit up above. Uh, we have R is 10, C is 0 0.02, Q at 0 is 0, and E is that guy there. Find Q and Q of T, I of T. What's the maximum charge on the capacitor when T is very big? Uh, and when will it occur? Okay, well, I don't know. Um, so we got uh, some switch capacitor, resistor. 10 ohms. 0 0.02 farad. Now 0 0.02 farads is, a, is bigger than my fist when it comes to a capacitor. That's a pretty big capacitor. Q at 0 is 0. Got that. And this guy over here is 10 cosine, 100 cosine, 120 T. Is that house current yet? No, it still isn't house current. It's got to be 120 pi T in order to have house current. Okay, so back to what we know. The voltage across the resistor is um, IR. The voltage across the capacitor is Q over C. And I is dQ dt. So the voltage across the resistor is yeah. dQ yeah. dt yeah. r. Yeah. Oh, for my for my I of t. Yeah. Everything else is okay. Right. So E of t is something different. It's one hundred. E to the minus 5t. And uh, I still want to find the maximum charge. Okay. So I haven't done anything really bad yet. So I've got, um, and that's 10. So 10 dQ dt plus Q over 0 0.02 is equal to 10. 100 e to the minus 5t. Okay, and then we'd manipulate that sum before we'd want to solve it. So 10 dQ dt is equal to 50 plus 50. Plus 50q is equal to 100 e to the minus 5t. Uh, divide everything by 10. Uh, Q prime plus 5q is equal to 10 e to the minus 5t. And then I would go and say I have a characteristic equation. Characteristic equation is um, r plus 5 equals 0. r is going to be minus 5. q um, c is going to be um, c1 e to the minus 5t. And then I've got a um, q sub p which is going to be um, A, e to the minus 5t, and Q prime of P, minus 5A, e to the minus 5t. I want uh, one of this guy and five of that guy. And then when I get done, I want to be uh, 10, e to the minus 5t. So I got 5 minus 5 is 0. 5 minus 5 is 0? Oh, no. Yeah, 5 minus 5 is 0. How did I do that? Oh, wow. Well. Five of those, one of those, oh, oh, I know how. My y sub p is wrong because my y sub p has an e to the minus 5 in it. Bummer. 
All right, so I'm going to have to pick a I'm going to have to pick a different one. So I'm going to say QP is equal to a x e to the minus 5t. Q prime of p is equal to a e to the minus 5t minus 5 x e to the minus 5t. I want five of those and one of those. And when I get done, I want um, and it's not really x, it's really a t, right? Our variable's t, so I'd put a t there. Um, I want 10 e to the minus 5t. In order to have that, uh, that means that um, this is uh, a e to the minus 5t. So a is 10. So now q of t becomes c1 e to the minus 5t plus 10 t e to the minus 5 t. And that would be my solution for Q. Am I supposed to be solving for that Q? Um, yes, find Q of T. So I have Q of T. Uh, I have to apply the initial condition. Q at 0 is 0. So Q at 0 is 0 means that C1 has to be 0. Wow. Really? Wow. All right. So so uh, that being the case, Q of T is equal to 10 T e to the minus 5 T. I of T, being the first derivative of that, is going to be uh, 10 e to the minus 5 T minus 5 minus 50. 50 T e to the minus 5 T. Well, isn't that special? Looking at number 8. And, uh, wow, that's what it says it is. Oh. So uh, both of those check with the back of the book, even though we don't like it. But we don't have to like the answer, just so that it checks. That's all I really want. Now, we want to find the maximum charge for at t greater than 0. Okay, so we're going to set i equal to 0 and find what t that is. And whatever t that is, we're going to put back into that equation to find the maximum charge. Okay, so um, this is at t. This is equal to 0. 10 e to the minus 5 t minus 50 t e to the minus 5 t. Um, I can divide by e to the minus 5t. I can divide by 10. 0 is equal to 1 minus 5t. t is equal to 1 fifth. So at t equal to 1 fifth, uh, I'm going to have my maximum q. So q at 1, q at 1 fifth of a second is going to equal 10 times one-fifth e to the minus one. Yeah, e to the minus one. And at that point, we can take out our calculator. So that's going to be, um, well, just uh, that's two over e. Hmm. We're going to check the back of the book. Maybe the author left it that way. Um, yep, two over e exactly what the author left. Okay, with that we're done with chapter section 2-7, now we're going to do 2-8. Okay, so now we have eigenvalue endpoint problems. So um, we have some string flying up and down in the air and it's attached to the wall 
at the wall, it has to be zero. It can't move from the wall. Its velocity has to be zero at the wall. It can't move up and down at the wall. So its position is zero at the wall and stays there. But now I end up with a standing wave on the string. And that's basically what our eigenvalue problems are. And luckily we only have to do, I only have to do two, you have to do three. So we'll start with number two. And we say, if I can find number two. All right, so y double prime plus y lambda y is equal to zero. Uh, y at prime at zero is zero, and y prime at pi is also zero. And lambda is our eigenvalue. Okay, so that's what we're going to consider. Okay, so we're going to rewrite the equation y double prime plus alpha squared y is equal to zero. And then we're going to say we have a characteristic equation r squared plus alpha squared is equal to zero. So r is equal to um, plus or minus alpha. Um, no, it's not. It's only equal to alpha. Because alpha squared uh, i, right? Because it's going to be a negative sign. Yeah. So alpha i. I guess that I, I can make it plus or minus alpha i. Uh, how did the upside down y over this all go to the alpha? The lambda. Yeah. Well, if you look on if you look on page uh, one eighty three, it says um, allow lambda to be alpha squared. So that's what we're doing. So lambda is equal to alpha squared. Now, why, why couldn't we just call it the square root of lambda, right? We, we could have said that, and we could have not done that and said that this is the uh, square root of lambda i, right? That would have been the same effect, right? So I think it's just a, a saving. Okay, that being the case, y of x is going to be um, a cosine alpha x plus b sine alpha x. Alright. Now we're going to apply an initial condition. Let's see, what initial condition do we want? We want y prime of x. We're going to calculate that guy first. Um, it's going to be minus alpha a alpha sine alpha x plus b alpha cosine alpha x. And then we're going to say y prime at 0 is 0. Okay, y prime at 0 is 0. So the, uh, the sine function doesn't, we don't care, the sine function is going to always be 0 at 0. So that means the cosine um, at 0, the cosine function would be 0. At zero, the cosine would be one. All right. Okay. So I think this is trying to tell me that B has to be zero. Yeah. 
Okay, so so B has to be zero. I'm going to look at 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 pi has to be zero. So that's telling me that B has to be zero. So that means that that this guy is going to be y prime of x is going to be minus a alpha sine alpha x. But at zero, this guy has to be um, at zero. That guy is zero. Okay. But at zero, for this guy to be zero, I mean, we, 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 um, okay, so that guy's always zero, that's fine. Hmm. So that, so we haven't done anything wrong yet. We have that this is true. Okay, I'm on page 183, and I'm saying that y of x is now going to be y of x is going to be a cosine alpha x. a cosine alpha x. And then I'm going to say, that being the case, if b is not 0, then I have a y of L, the length is equal to A cosine alpha L. The alpha L has to be either pi or 2 pi or 3 pi up to n pi. And those would be my eigenvalues. Now my, my, so my eigenvalues, if this is equal to um, um, lambda is equal to alpha squared. So my my eigenvalues would be pi squared over L squared to four four pi squared four pi squared over L squared where L is the length. Uh, 9, 9 pi squared over L squared. Okay, I think that that uh, is what this guy is trying to tell me. Number 2 in 87. Um, positive eigenvalues associated cosine nx. Yeah, I think that's what it's trying to tell me. Okay. Moving on to number, what did I do? Lose my place again? Number four. Y double prime plus lambda Y is zero. Y prime at minus pi equals zero y prime at pi equals zero. Okay. So I'm going to go and say lambda is equal to alpha squared again. We write this y double prime plus alpha squared y is zero. Have a characteristic equation. Um, R squared plus alpha squared is zero. 
r is going to be equal to plus or minus alpha i y of x a cosine x plus b um, cosine alpha o sine alpha x. I'm going to find y prime at x. And I'm going to say minus a alpha sine x plus b alpha cosine x. Should not be alpha x then? Hmm? Should not be alpha x then? Where? Uh, sine alpha x. Sine alpha x. alpha x alpha x right there. You mean right there? Plain as day? Where to go? Okay. Now we're going to apply an initial condition that says y prime at pi is supposed to be 0. And y prime at minus pi is supposed to be 0. Okay, when I put pi and minus pi, the sine guy goes away. But the cosine guy doesn't go away. So I'm going to have to have b be equal to 0. So I'm going to have b be equal to 0 so the cosine guy can go away. Now the sine guy is still there. And I want him to be 0. So I want alpha alpha x has to be multiple multiples of pi that, that's basically what we're saying if alpha x are multiple of pi's then sine of whatever it is is always going to be zero and everything's going to be fine so we say that that um, we change alpha x with an alpha l which is the length and we say alpha l is equal to pi so um, alpha is pi over l but I can put an n there because it's multiples of pi over l. And then I can say my eigenvalue lambdas, which is alpha squared, is going to be these guys squared. So the first one's going to be 1. And I'll have pi squared over l squared. The second guy is going to be 2. So that'd be 4 pi squared over l squared. Next guy's going to be 3, 9 pi squared over l squared, and so on. Okay, well that should be clear as mud. Is that as clear as mud? Now why would I want to do that to myself? Well obviously there's something coming on in chapter 5 to, to help us out, right? Yeah. So that's the reason. So we introduce eigenvalues. Don't expect an eigenvalue problem on your chapter 2 test. Okay, excellent. Um, but we introduce the word, so when we say the word in chapter 5, you'll have heard it before, and you said eigenvalue. Yeah, that's the thing with the lambda. And then uh, you proceed on from there. Okay, see how that works? But what it's saying is that um, here's 0, there's a number line, here's, five, here's pi, there's minus pi. So I have some function that is doing something like that, or doing something like this, or doing something like this. 
or doing something like like whatever it is, so that I always get back to zero at both ends. And the way I do that is with lambdas that are different. And it wouldn't have been great if I did that in multiple colors and not messed it up that bad. And it's saying that these are the values of lambda for which that string will vibrate between minus pi and pi, back and forth. Well, that means that we're done an hour early is there some problem you need me to solve for uh, getting ready for the chapter test? Like, for example, a, a variation of parameter problem, for example, which you know you're going to have. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to go back to page 161, and I'm going to look at problem 56. And I got y double prime minus 4y is equal to x e to the x. And um, use the variation of parameter problem to find a particular solution to the equation. Well, we're not going to do that. We're going to find the whole solution to the equation. Now, this would be easy enough to do, do with um, a, a different method. So our... our um, undetermined coefficient method where, where we go well, x of p is going to be um, a e to the x plus b x e to the x. We work just fine in this problem, but it's not uh, asking us to do it that way, so we're not going to. And we're going to say, well, we have a characteristic equation. r squared minus 4 is 0. r is equal to um, plus or minus 2. So y1 is uh, e to the minus 2x, and y2 is uh, e to the 2x. Okay, so I have two independent solutions. Either one of those will work, um, and um, I've got them. Now I'm going to find my y sub p. And luckily, page 160 is sitting there. y sub p says minus y1 e to the minus 2x. Uh, well, before we do that, we need the raw scan, right? So we'll go and find the raw scan of uh, y1, y2, so that it's convenient. All right, so I've got e to the minus 2x minus e to the minus 2x e to the 2x 2e to the 2x, and you wondered uh, what happened to that 2 sitting right there. Yes, no, you did. Okay, so I've got 2e, I have 2. 2 minus a minus 2 giving me a 4. So the rot scan is a 4. And so y sub p is going to be minus e to the minus 2x integral the um, y2 e to the 2x times the forcing function x e to the 2x x e to the x divided by 4. Boy, that was very professional the way I wrote that, wasn't it? e to the x divided by 4 plus y2, which is e to the 2x, integral e to the minus 2x, x e to the x, divided by 4. And again, I left off my, my dx's, which I really shouldn't do. All right, so y sub p is uh, minus e to the minus 2x, integral, um, x e to the 3x over 4 dx plus e to the 2x integral x e to the x over 4 dx. Oh, what do you think? Integration by parts? We have a choice. It's either integration by parts or find the integral in the back of the book. 
Uh, those are our two choices. So we'll do an integration by parts. Um, the de derivative of xy is equal to uh, y prime x plus x prime y. I integrate both sides and I find that the integral of x prime y is equal to xy minus the integral of y prime x. Right? And then I, that's my integration by parts formula. If y were x, oh gee, y is x. I say, so if y were x, then y prime would be 1. Okay, so if, if y were x, then y prime would be 1. And um, x prime would have to be e to the 3x, which means that x would have to be 1 third e to the 3x, right? And then while we're doing it, we might as well do this guy too. Um, so we're going to let um, y equal x, y prime equal 1, x prime equal e to the x, and x equal e to the x. So we'll do both of them at the same time, even though we can't see either of them while we're doing it. Okay, hmm, how are we going to do that? I guess we just have to remember what it was. So um, y sub p is equal to minus e to the minus 2x times times, uh, oh, we'll make it over 4, so we don't have to worry about that 4 guy. Over 4, and we're going to have xy, x, xy, so that'd be 1 third x e to the 3x minus the integral of y prime, which is 1 x which is 1 over 3e to the 3x plus the other guy. What's the other guy? e to the 2x over 4 integral, not integral, no integral yet. over 4, and I want um, xy, xy, so that'd be a, an x e to the x minus integral y prime x, e to the x dx, close parentheses. Okay, there we go. y prime minus e to the minus 2x over 4 times 1 third x e to the 3x minus minus e to the 3x over 9. Plus e to the 2x over 4 times 1 third, no not 1 third, times uh, x e to the x minus e to the x. Okay, excellent. About time we change colors, isn't it? y sub p um, looks like I've got x e to the x over 12 with a minus sign plus e to the x over 36 plus 
e to the 3x, x e to the 3x over 4, minus e to the x over 4. All right, so that, that would be what the answer in the back of the book should be if we got it right. So uh, number 30, 50, 56, section 2, 5. Section 2, 5, 56. And it says minus 1 ninth e to the x, 3x plus 2. Very interesting. Very interesting. Which, of course, isn't anything like what I have. Right? Like nothing at all. Not even close. So now, the issue is, can we find the mistake? Um, okay, so that's going to be 2. That's going to be 2. Looks like that's going to be 4 e to the x, e to the minus 2x, x, e to the minus x. Okay, so our first mistake is right here. This is a minus sign right there uh, instead of a plus sign. All right, so if that's a minus sign instead of a plus sign, And y is x. And y prime. Then this would be a minus. This would be a minus, a minus. Okay. Everything's okay down there. But this is going to be. Okay, so that's fine. But this is going to be a minus sine. Okay, this is going to be a minus sign there, a minus sign here. It's going to be a minus sign there and a plus sign there. Okay. So now I, this is right, that's right, that's right. That's okay, but I got a minus sign here, a minus sign there, a minus sign here, which makes this a plus sign. No, it would, you know, that still stays a minus sign because this. It's minus e to the x. So that guy is minus, this guy is plus. This guy would have to stay minus. So we're going to keep him a minus. All right, so now I've got 1 12th x e to the x, that's right, minus e to the x, that, plus. So uh, back to minus. This is a minus e to the x over 4. And this is a minus e to the x. Over 4. Okay, so I've got Um, I got one quarter minus one twelfth. Okay, so what's now? I got one one quarter plus one twelfth. One, no, minus one quarter minus minus one twelfth minus one quarter one minus one third. So this is minus one third x e to the x. And then I've got one 
30 second minus one quarter minus two ninths e to the x. Okay, how do we do? 59, 56. Okay, one third x is correct. Minus two ninths is correct. Yes. Okay. Check back a book. Okay, so now it's time for final answer. Final answer. Y is equal to YC plus YP. Um, anybody remember what YC was? Um, yeah, we did. C1 e to the minus 2x. e to the minus 2x plus C2. We didn't write it down, e to the 2x, but we solved for, right. for both of them. Uh, minus 1 third x e to the x plus 2 ninths e to the x. And that's clearly a negative sign, even though I put a positive one there. Okay, good enough. Another one? Nobody else wants anything else? Okay. What if, what if we have something weird? What's, um, what if my characteristic equation was um, 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 let's say it was r minus i times r plus 1 and r was 1 and i what would I do? You don't make sure. What would you do with that? You see one? You see you don't you don't have any you, you don't have alpha plus or minus beta i anymore so you can't write down cosine plus sine thing what are you going to do well you're going to say y is equal to um, c1 e to the x plus uh, c2 e to the i x in order for it to be sine and cosine I have to have plus or minus beta i. I have to have the complex conjugates. I don't have the complex conjugates anymore. So now that begs the issue, what is e to the i x? Well, e to the i x becomes uh, cosine x plus i sine x, which is different than um, c1 cosine x plus c2 sine x, because i got an imaginary number sitting there. But there will be a problem on the chapter 2 test that has an imaginary number, not the complex conjugates in it. You just deal with it like it's a real number and write it just like that, e to the ix. Would you just leave it like that? Have That's right. Exactly. You would not do this. You'd only do that if you're in a complex variable class, and you're not. So you'd leave it just like that. And that would be perfectly okay. Right. Yeah. Right. So if you had a if you had a situation where your characteristic equation ended up with solutions of two i, three i, those are not complex conjugates. We can't apply the the uh, sine and cosine thing. So so we say y is equal to y of x is equal to c one e to the two i x plus c2 e to the 3ix, and be, and be perfectly happy with that. And it, it would, in fact, check. If I check that solution, it would check to be correct. Of course, I don't, I'm not showing the differential equation it's for. And somewhere in the book are those problems. Let's see if I can find them.
Yeah, look at uh, 46 on page 130, so on, on page 134, looking at uh, number 46. And I've got uh, y double prime minus iy prime plus 6y is equal to zero. So I have a, a characteristic equation r squared minus ir plus 6 is 0. And then I'm, I factor that. And um, hmm, maybe 3 times 2. So 3 times 2 minus i i r r and then I've got I've got six minus six times i squared making it plus six and then I got minus three i plus two i making it just one i minus one i and then I say my, my r's are um, minus two i three i and then I say y of x is uh, e to the minus 2ix plus c1, c1 plus c2 e to the 3ix. And then I, I check my work, right? Because I'm a studious type of guy. So y c1 e to the minus 2ix plus c2 e to the 3ix y prime minus 2i c1 e to the minus 2ix plus 3i c2 e to the 3ix y double prime um, minus minus makes a minus i and i makes another minus minus 4 c1 e to the minus 2ix uh, minus 9 c2 e to the 3ix and then if I have um, one of these guys minus i of those guys and six of these guys I'm supposed to get zero all right so I've got six c1s I got four c1s I've got another two c1s um, which are minus. So I got minus 4, minus another 2 for minus 6. I got plus 6. That term goes away. I've got 6 of those. I've got 3 more for 9 of those. And then I got minus 9. That term goes away. 0 is equal to 0. Check. Okay? But all I'm, all I'm doing is just I'm just keeping the imaginary operator i square root of minus 1 as an i, just treating it like it is, writing down answers, and everything is fine in the world. Okay, anything else I need to talk about? If not, we will uh, call it a day.